And it looks like we are live, Jeremy. Come on, where's that glare? Come on. Yeah, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah dude, glare. as soon as we start, you had it. And then as soon as we start, then you go, you take it away. I love it. All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another stream of The Other Side of the Die. Uh, my name is Paul Postal, and this is my counterpart, Jeremy Kimberling. Jeremy, good to see you. Good to see you too, Paul. How are things been going for you? It's been going good. Uh, daughter's birthday, trampoline parks, all kinds of fun stuff. How about yourself? Uh, not bad. So uh, we have a new uh, new place in our town, one of those um, city center places with a bunch of outdoor areas and restaurants and places like that. So we went there to my wife and my daughter and I to eat in a new restaurant. We played mini golf for a little bit. So a huh. little putt putt. It was a nice day. It was 73 degrees here. It was a beautiful, beautiful. day. So, yeah, beautiful weekend here too. Yeah. So, what are we uh, what are we digging into tonight? So, this evening we're going to talk about how. Uh, well, let me first of all say this: you uh, you, you rushed me a little bit, Jeremy. The, <laughs> my bad. My that's bad. okay. So, uh, once again, want to welcome everybody to the other side of the die. And basically, the premise of our live stream is where you can have less drama and more fun at your tabletop role playing game table, whether that's virtual or it's actually in person. Um, so that's really our goal is for you to, to show you ways of how you can have less drama, less players getting upset, less you getting upset while you're running games, or if you're a player, less of you getting upset and increasing the fun at the table. So our topic tonight is going to be how to make combat not suck without pissing off your players. And also want to point out, if you look down below, down below. All of our socials are down there. So please drop us a line at one of those um, social links. Be uh, more than happy to hear from you. Be glad to hear from you. Um, we do stream every other Sunday starting at 8 p.m. Um, Eastern U.S. time. And we're going to go until Jeremy, Jeremy and I run out of things to talk about. So Jeremy, you know, sometimes our streams have gone 30 minutes. One time we went for an hour and a half. <laughs> Yeah, because yep, we had so one. much to talk about. I don't remember what the topic was, but yeah, it was a good one. So tonight, how to run combat in your tabletop role playing game without pissing off your players. And we have a few topics that we want to go through. And the first one, actually, all of these, I'm looking at our notes, are kind of controversial. But this one first one we have on here has is age old controversy yep. within tabletop role playing games. And that is the concept of fudging dice. So, Jeremy. Be yeah. honest. Yeah. As a player, and when you've been running games, have you ever fudged dice? 100%. Uh, not as a player. <laughs> not as a player, but as a DM, 100%. I was waiting because oh, I was yeah. thinking, I was like, I wonder if he's going to fall into that trap I laid for him. Um, oh, as yeah. a player, have <laughs> you done a... it? Uh, um, yeah, go ahead. So, honestly, I, did, I, I have as a player, but I started yeah. playing when I was like nine. Right. So now the dude, the dude do the, uh, what, what, what I see online and what I've actually seen players do where they take the die and they roll it and then immediately cover it or pick it pick up. Pick it up. And so, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, it was a nat 20. <laughs> so, yeah. so funny thing about players and fudging dice. Uh, my friend, we, we, when I was younger, we all played in person, right? One of my right. players, one of my players, we would roll, st roll for stats and he would come to me and he's like, Hey, these are the stats I rolled. Like we'd be sitting at the table. So I'm trying to watch everybody roll. And he'd been like, these right. are my stats. And I'm like, all right. And I would look at them and I'm like, no, you cheated. And he's like, I swear. And I'm like, so you're telling me you rolled an 18, 18, 17, 18, 16. And he's like, yeah, I yeah. totally did. And uh, it was him and one of my other buddies. They would pull that stuff with me all the time. And I'm like, guys, yeah. Like you don't got to be a genius at probability to know that you did. Yeah, not that is that. not happening. Now I will say though, speaking of fudging dice on stats, I have seen in all my years of running games, because I as as we've talked about, I use fantasy grounds. I did mm -hmm. have a player making a character that he never actually got to play, but we were just making backup characters. And I'm telling you, man, I am not kidding you. I sat there and watched him roll four 18s. It, it can happen. It can happen. But that was but one time yeah, yeah. in all the year in my whole life of playing D and D. It's happened and, one time. So I I've seen it as well. I have seen a player roll those kind of stats, and I'm like, do you actually want to play these? 
because the the biggest problem is is uh, at that point you start getting into like a god complex. If one yep. player has four eighteens, they're basically a god, and like it's going to be almost impossible to challenge them. Uh, yeah, but yeah, fudging dice. I do you fudge dice as a DM? I have fudged dice as a DM, and yeah. in and here's why. And I've had debates online with people, and also in person. But most of my debates now with other DMs are online. But I look at D and D as yes, it's a game. There's mechanics and there's rules and there's structure with it. But all that structure is in place to tell a story. Yeah. And if yeah. it's going to make more narrative sense and um, it's going to enhance the experience, I will actually fudge dice. Now, most of the time, I have fudged dice in the player's favor. Now, not yeah, to say time. not to say that I'm trying to make the game easier for them, but as a DM, there are times when you realize you can just sense the room and you realize that if you don't move things along, yeah, it's going to get boring. And 100%. when your and when your players are making skill checks, as I talked about in the last stream, I think it was. On Fantasy Grounds, I have all my players make skill checks in the dice tower. Yeah. Okay? And I just, there has been times that, like, they have failed. They keep failing. They keep failing. They keep failing on skill checks. And finally, like, listen, even if they fail, I will just say they succeed. Because I just know if we don't move this story along, yeah. it's going to get boring and we need to move it along. The The main thing that I think I fudge dice on are enemy crits. That's probably the number one thing that I I end up budging because what can happen is you come up with an encounter. Maybe there's 12 goblins, right? They're supposed to be pretty easy. But in that first Salvio, what happens if there's four crits? The All of a sudden, this combat that I designed is completely thrown out of whack because there's four crits on the first round of combat. I'm going to fudge some of those dice uh, mainly because what you're saying, it, it takes so much away. It's not fun. It didn't create tension. It was like you just down two players and we created a terrible scenario. That that's not fun. Uh and it's it's improbable. Like it's very improbable that that's going to happen. Uh so that is typically the thing that I do is I will it, I'll make them hit. I will still have all those enemies hit. Mm -hmm. I might just change it from a crit to a hit uh just to make combat fun cuz it's not fun getting downed in the first round or the second round. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I have different scenarios in which I will, whether or not I will take away an enemy crit or not. Yeah. New players, new players who are learning the game, I want them to have fun. I want them to enjoy D&D as much as I do. And so if that situation is happening where the bad guy is just, you know, critting or even sometimes I'll change a hit to a miss. You know, yeah. because I can just tell this new players like, why the hell am I playing this game? <laughs> this is yeah. not fun. And uh, I will, for new players, I will usually go, and I think I've said this before, I will go from, depending on how quickly they're getting it, I'll either go up to third level where the kid gloves are on. Sometimes yeah. I may go to fifth level because we all know in fifth edition D&D, &D, at fifth level, there's there's a nice power bump. Yeah, you yeah know? huge power spike for everybody right there. Right, absolutely. So then it's like, okay, the kid gloves are going to come off in there. Um, there was so something else. It, else. Go ahead. There's something uh, else I was so, going to say, but I can't remember. Go ahead. So I just remember as a younger kid, very, very less experienced, right. uh, I remember w I had a friend who it was his first time playing with, with me and my group. He's playing as a wizard. And I don't know if you remember this, but there's a whole bunch of jokes about how little HP wizards mm -hmm. have. Yep. In older editions, they rolled a D4 and they typically didn't have a con bonus. So you could have a fifth level wizard and only have like, 12 hp right it, like it, it was possible so we were level one and uh it, like just started the campaign he had i think three hit points as his wizard had three hit points uh and it was like an orc threw a rock at him and crit it, it was like the first combat it was like they got attacked on the road first combat and the orc threw a rock at the, the wizard and hit him for like uh, 12 hit points and in the older editions if you ever get hit for like a certain amount of damage you're just like instantly dead and that's exactly yep. what happened 
Uh, so yeah, that that guy played with me one time. It was that one we built a character, played a session. I hit him with a rock, and he died before he could do anything. And yeah. he never came back to play. Yeah, I mean that's just not fun. So that's what yeah. with new players, I will change crits to hits, and sometimes, like I said, I'll even change hits to to misses. Um, another scenario where I may fudge dice like that, you know, with a player is what you're talking about. Is if the bad guy is getting like three or four crits, you know, maybe not yeah. right in a row. Cause that's kind of improbable, but if, if they're getting a lot of crits during combat, then yeah. yes, I will, I will change those as well. Um, but you know, sometimes, it, you know, that, that's the problem. There's such an art more than a science to DM. I mean, it just, it's yeah. a case by case basis. It's a game by game basis, session by session. And sometimes you just have to feel the room. And yeah. if the players yeah. are enjoying the combat and you know, they're Keep like, going. they seem cool with it. I'll yeah. let, then I won't fight the dice. I'll yeah. let the bad guys hit. Keep hitting. Yeah, yeah. It, it's and I I think if you're a DM who's fudging dice uh, a lot, you probably need to work on how you're structuring your combats a lot more. Yeah, because it should not be something you're doing very often. Yep. I I think I probably do it once. I mean, I don't even think I do it once a month. I probably fudge. Uh, I mean once every 20 sessions or so more often than not i'm going to let things play out it's just it kind of what you're saying read the room and know that i have to make this adjustment or it's just destroying the fun to a level that it's going to be hard for me to bring back yep uh so kind of on the flip side the enemy crits a whole bunch you fudge it what happens if uh what happens if the party crits crazy amount of times kind of going into our next topic so yeah, that's I was about to to go there. So I'm glad uh, you and I have the Vulcan mind meld, you know, going on there. Uh, yeah. Add adding or subtracting hit points to combat. Yep. I've done it. Um, oh yeah. I've done it um, quite a bit. Yeah. And for but, the, for the same reason, because yeah. again, I feel like the purpose here is to tell a story, and if there's a piece of information that the bad guy needs to monologue and give to the players, give to the player characters. Well, if he just is, you know, knocked out within the first, you know, yeah. one, two or three rounds, you know, then that can, you know, it's not going to derail the campaign, but it's just going to make your life difficult. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'll just add, you know, some hit points to him if I need to combat to go a little longer for some reason. So I always try to have like a tester combat after the party's leveled up. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of times in that tester combat, I'll have a flexible HP for the enemy. And that's really because I don't know how powerful that level up was for the party. Yep. So having a combat where I can just instantly add hit points or take a whole bunch away because it was way too hard uh, really lets me make the combat still fun and challenging without making it way too easy or way too hard so i i think adding hit points uh i will typically do it the most right after a level up and then hopefully by the second or third combat i don't have to do that anymore yep yeah i'm with you and um what about the flip side of that though what about subtracting hit yeah. points oh yeah i do, that. I do that all the time yeah Wait. under what situation do you do you do that so you get that moment where the tension's starting to build up, the the rogue or somebody lands a, a not a critical hit, but a very uh, important hit. Maybe the rogue hasn't hit for two rounds, right? Mm -hmm. And then he, he barely scapes by on the third round and he barely hits the enemy and he rolls nine hit points of damage and the enemy has 10. That enemy just lost 10 hit points, right? I'm not going to make it stand with one hit point when letting that character kill the creature at that moment is going to be way more impactful to that player into the table than giving the person one more hit point. Right. I mean, I, I agree with you there. I mean, you might as well just take that one hit point away and yeah. just say the rogue. I mean, especially in that situation, like you're saying, the rogue for like two or three rounds hasn't hit. Yeah. And they're feeling useless. And then yep. they're the ones that deliver the the killing blow so yeah i mean that i i absolutely um agree with um going into i'm gonna i'm gonna take one of our topics further on and yeah. merge it with this one because the number one reason that i will subtract hit points 
is that the combat is starting to become a slog. 100%. Uh, Did you ever play 4th Edition? No, I skipped over 4th Edition. So 4th Edition had basically uh, minions. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of like the the minion mob? Yep. So all minion mobs have one hit point, right? Uh, So you don't have to state that they have one one hit point. Typically, the party picks up pretty quickly that these creatures are really easy to down. Uh, Mm -hmm. 100%. If uh, I will try to, in a lot of fights, have minions, especially as the party gets higher level, uh, having those minion level monsters are really just being able to wipe them out is is pretty fun. But yeah, when combat starts to drag on, and you can tell, you start lowering the crap out of people's hit points to get that combat over. The second it's boring, it's it's lost its use. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things that you have to kind of judge there because you don't want to just end the combat like right away within the next round or two. Because yeah. and your players are going to go, well, I thought this was supposed to be like, you know, a mini boss. And yeah. now we defeated him that easily. So it's kind of, it becomes like kind of a hollow victory, you know, yeah. for them. And it, so you, and it, what I was going to say was, is that, you know, you have to start gradually kind of lowering the hit points, mm-hmm, you know? So, mm-hmm. okay, you know what? Um, player did, you know, 13 points of damage. I'm just going to add another five on top of that. And then just start gradually lower it down so it doesn't become such a hollow victory. Now, I kind of feel like if it's not a boss or a mini boss um, or something like that, and it's just like a filler combat, if it starts becoming a slog because the creature they're fighting or the NPC they're fighting doesn't hit very hard, but it has a crap ton of hit points, yeah, just, just end the combat. I mean, then what I do in that situation is like, okay, guys, I flat out have told my players before, this is dragging on. All right. One more round of combat. You guys are going to kill this thing. So you tell me on your next hit. Yeah. How do you do it? How do you do it? Get very descriptive with them. How are you as a group coup de gras in this thing? Exactly. You guys have done enough. How do you as a group want to coup de gras this? That's a, I I've never done that. And I love that idea of, Hey guys, you guys are obviously going to win this. How do you mop up? Right. That'd be great. I mean, as a play, go ahead. So yeah. what I really like about that is most mm-hmm. of the time it is the DM narrating most of what's going on. Where yeah. in this scenario, you're literally giving control of a lot of your narrative powers to the party and say, how do you guys yep. want this boss to end up dying for you? Like, it, I'm going to end up using that because I, I really, really do like that. I, I wish that was original with me. It's not. <laughs> I stole hey, it from hey, somebody hey. else, but that's what I, we all do. Point, I was going to say, at this point, I feel like everything we all do for D&D has been, been stolen. It has been stolen. But yeah, I mean, it's great because as a player, if you're fighting, you know, enemies that aren't hitting hard, they're not doing any mm-hmm. damage to you, but you're hitting them and they're not going down. I mean, how much fun is that? Yeah, it's it's, it's interesting. And I so some DMs, and I've played with some of them, where they like to run dungeons and stuff like that, where it's like a war of attrition. Uh I mean, it. That's not my style. Uh, I typically don't play with those kind of DMs for for very long. The few times I have been a player, just because it, I don't like playing a war of attrition. It, it's not a video game, and I don't want it to feel like a video game. So, explain what you mean by war of attrition. Uh, so you have a combat that is super slugfest, deep, right? Mm-hmm. And we're in a dungeon, so we can't rest. And the whole right. reason this was a slugfest is because we're going to go to the next fight which is a slugfest to get rid of more resources to then go to the next fight. Uh, that is a so it's a war of attrition, right? right. Like they, they have a mm-hmm. bunch of really boring combats just because they want to make the final boss hard. And the only way to do that is to take a whole bunch of your resources away before you get right. there. Right. Now I have advised some DMs online. I'm, g- I'm going to relate these two things here. They're going to seem kind of disparate, but I'm going to relate them to what you're you're saying here. So I've seen some new DMs online talk about how they've had the party go up against one lone NPC or bad guy who they thought was uber powerful and didn't understand why their party mopped the floor with them. And I saw somebody explain online, and I've used this this analogy since, is that you really look at it from a mechanical perspective because we've all talked about action economy, right? 
And I've had, I've had people online ask what action economy is. Don't look at your group of players or their characters. Don't look at them as individual entities. Mechanically yeah. look at them as they are one entity against yeah. your one lone bad guy. So what yeah. that means is your one lone bad guy can have maybe, what, two or three attacks. But yeah. then the party as a whole has multiple of attacks, and that's exactly why your one lone bad guy Oh yeah, got, got the floor wiped with them. Now, I said uh, I was going to relate this, and I'm trying to remember what we were talking about before so, so I could relate them. What were we talking uh, the, about? Uh, a, a war of attrition. War uh, of attrition. So, okay. Yeah, so the I think the way to make, especially with one entity – or mm-hmm. anything like that, you have to start introducing uh, fun abilities that the creature mm-hmm. has, right? Like that that's how you make that combat interesting. Uh, and then legendary, obviously legendary actions and stuff right. like that. Uh, if, if it's ever one creature, you almost have to give it legendary actions just mm-hmm. to equal out that a- action economy. But yeah, just fun abilities is uh, you have a goblin, you know, Matt Colville has one where it's like this, where you're fighting a goblin like king or something like that. One of his abilities should be he rolls a dice, and if it's a certain number, another goblin shows up. Yeah. Yeah. I've, he talks about action oriented monsters. Yeah. yeah. Action oriented watch... monsters. Fantastic. I love that idea. Yeah. That's uh, a great video. That's an awesome oh, it's, video. It's one of his best ones, I think. We should uh, actually, when I put this on YouTube, I'll put the link in there to yeah, that link, video. Yeah. Link it to it. But let me, let me, so let me finish my thought because I remember now about yep. the, what I was going to relate this to War of Attrition. So. Because the situation you talked about was it's very obvious to the players what's happening, right? Mm-hmm. You play D&D long enough, you understand what the War of Attrition is. Okay, DM's got a big combat up ahead, so what he's trying to do is whittle away our resources. And that's painfully obvious and can completely yeah. take players out of the story of the game. So yeah. I'm relating that to the action economy because I have advised um, other DMs that... When you never have the party fight one lone bad guy, have yeah. minions in there. And and I prefer to use glass cannon minions where the minions hit hard. But yeah, to your but, point earlier, they've got yeah. very few hit points. So yeah. one hit, they go down. And the purpose is obviously to soak up attacks, soak up yeah. resources. But, but that makes narrative sense because in real life, in movies, think about it. The heroes yeah. never go up against a bad guy all by himself. No, he it, always has minions the, with him. There's very few like combats where I think that one is appropriate. Right. Uh, and they always have like really, really awesome abilities when you do. Uh, right. Honestly, if you're going to have a dungeon and you plan 15 to 20 combats, uh, you need in session zero, you need to be telling people like, hey, I do run dungeons that are 20 combats long. Yeah. Yeah, you absolutely need to. If you tell so, me that, I'm going to say, hey, I love you as a person. I'm going to sit this one. <laughs> I'm yeah, just going to exactly. sit that one out. I'd, uh, I'm not a kid anymore. That is something that younger younger people tend to enjoy a lot more, right? Because mm-hmm. they still think of the this game that we're playing, TTRPG, is much more like a video game. And so they want it to feel a lot more like that. But as you get a more mature audience, they're looking much more for the role-playing aspect. So you get 20 combats, they're they're done, they're checking out. Yeah, absolutely. So to and I and I'm with you and that's uh same thing. If I'm playing a game where it's just one slugfest after another, you know, I'm be like, "Okay, I'm 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 done with this." So, my point is to the people watching, if you're a new DM, I think it's okay to have minions with your boss. You mm-hmm. need to because it makes narrative sense. Don't have slugfest after slugfest after slugfest like jeremy is saying in your dungeons because it's going to be so obvious what the dm is trying to do and if you have a boss or a mini boss with minions that are thematically appropriate to that boss or mini boss then that makes narrative sense and that's okay yeah it's more memorable yes uh so just kind of going into slugfest and way to some some of the ways that I've used to break it up. Uh, mm-hmm. When we were kind of prepping for this a little bit, I said reinforcements, and you were like, I thought we were trying to come up with ways not to piss players off. Right. And honestly, I have used reinforcements a significantly more amount of times for my players than for the enemies. Uh, I feel like you should definitely, uh, talking about making combats, uh, fixing them in the middle of, of a fight, if 
the goblins notice that, hey, you know, they're attacking our, our home and they just wiped out 10 of our warriors. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to go get the women and every other man and tell them, hey, we got to come defend our house because these guys are coming in. Yeah. That makes sense for a huge swarm of them to come out and kind of fix the combat where it was, you know, it, you thought it was here and then the players in one round wiped it out and it's just like here and you just add a whole bunch more of those goblins or something to fix it in 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 a way that makes sense uh some i typically i think some of the coolest interactions i've had is i've had like a unicorn show up to help the players right they're they're in a, a heavy dense forest they're mm-hmm. fighting corruption or something inside of the forest and a unicorn pops up and heals one of the players and starts fighting with them. And it's like, whoa, what is going on? And then after the combat, the unicorn's like, hey, this is the forest that I've been protecting. You know, thanks for helping uh, helping out, blah, 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 blah. The unicorn could give a unicorn tier to them that can heal them. And all of a sudden, like, there's the a reinforcement. Reinforcement. They didn't know that that person was there to begin with. Just all of a sudden, a creature showing up. Okay. And Okay, I see what you're really saying. Cool scenarios. Okay, so you're talking about reinforcements, not just for the bad guys, but also reinforcements to the player characters too. I kind of I like that if it's if it's thematically appropriate, because otherwise, oh, yeah. because otherwise it looks like that. Okay, DM thought we couldn't handle this combat on our own, so he had to send in somebody, you know, to come help us. But introducing um, an NPC that way, amazing. Uh, one of the other ways. I've used this before too, and I really like doing this. I mm-hmm. you can't do it all the time, but it's a trick that I really do like. And it's uh, you know, hey, we know there's a whole bunch of enemies over this direction, right? Uh, we need you to just go collect information or something like that. And inevitably, the tar- party triggers. You know, they find the enemies find out that they're there, and they start to get attacked, right? So, hey, we know there's a whole bunch of orcs. We know there's a whole bunch of gnolls in this in this mountain area. And then the party retreats to a pass and can hold the pass for a little bit. Let the combat, and this, this is weird because we just talked about it, let the combat turn into a slugfest. And the second it feels like a slugfest, cavalry from the town, you know, uh, 10 horsemen come riding up and, and help you finish off the enemy, right? Okay. Uh, I think having them basically you have to defend this up until it feels boring and then something thematically happens to break that 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 tension and now we're going into the next segment of what's going on i've ran combats like that where it was going to go enemies were going to keep showing up up until it was boring and then it was you know then a group of allies would instantly show up combat's over Wow, I like that. I have never done that, but I love the idea behind that because that is another way to end the slugfest mm-hmm. without having to jump out of the game like I was saying earlier and telling the players, okay, guys, obviously you're going to win. You know, yeah. so how do you do this? I like that because, you know, if it, as long as it, you know, again, thematically fits, you know, the narrative, I love it because the player characters knew they were going to win anyway. But now you just kept something in the game without breaking immersion in there. That's brilliant. I love it. I've done it. Uh, I've done it a couple times with uh, big war scenarios. Yep. Where the players are frontline soldiers in a war, and they're going on. They've killed, and you let them wipe the enemies out. Right. Like all of these enemies are basically one hit. Right. I have the barbarian. If he's swinging an axe and he does a lot of damage with the first one. Roll a second attack. You just hit the soldier next to him, right? Really, like, just wiping the battlefield with soldiers. Just a mountain of carcasses around you. But it's never ending. And when you feel like you can't go on any longer, the king's vanguard comes around the corner and pushes the enemy out. And you watch as the vanguards and the cavalry, or some, you know, yep. notorious infant, uh, cavalry, push the enemy out. And you and the rest of the party and the soldiers you've been fighting with get that moment of watching a very elite military group finish them out and push out while, so you can catch your breath. Like, as stupid as it sounds, that can be really fun. You know, and I'm really loving that one. And I want to remember that because the my homebrew that I've la- tried to launch twice, I'm going to be redoing it. I think I told you I'm now going to put a war in the backdrop. 
Yeah. And I love that idea of doing that. And I'm sitting there thinking while you were talking about that, about the cavalry showing up or the King's Vanguard or whoever it is. Yeah. One of the things you could do is use that to lead into the next mission. It's like, you know, let's say like the cavalry shows up and the player characters have finished the combat. There's no more mm -hmm. bad guys. So the, there's nothing for the cavalry to do. So here's what I'm thinking. This is what, what popped in my imagination. The leader of the cavalry, Commander, you know, Hufflebud. I don't know. I just came up with that name. You know, Commander Kaz or something comes up and says, you know, hey, fantastic job. You guys were awesome in doing this. And now you can pump up the players' egos a little bit. And then mm -hmm. so, hey, you know, um, you know, Chief so-and-so wants to see you back at the camp. Something's yeah. come up. And now here's a great way for you to lead right into their next mission. Oh, yeah. And, like, you give them some – like, you That's guys awesome. were on the front. Every soldier around you is dead. You're the only five that made it out before – until right. this happened. Uh, I've had dragons. I've had a, a gold dragon fly by and wipe out the rest of the enemies in front of them. And then the remaining enemies turn and fled. I've ended combats like that. That was a reinforcement scenario. I've had powerful wizards, clerics, druids show up, cast one spell to wipe out the remaining enemies in front of them uh, and stuff like that in, in war scenarios. I, I think that's a more logical way to end big war battles than it is to you killed all the soldiers on the other side. Right. I like it. And plus, you know, then it, it gets kind of cinematic, too, because now, you know, and, and again, to your point, let's emphasize this. It's after the player characters have already, you know, yes. or they when let me say this, not after they've already killed everybody, but it's it's when you know that the players realize they're going to win this. Yeah. And now it's yeah. becoming a slugfest. So yep. cinematically having like a wizard or a dragon or a cleric or somebody like I'm just picturing like the gold dragon coming down, yep. just breathing yep. fire. That yeah. that is awesome, dude. That is yeah. that is fantastic. That's great. Okay, oh, yeah. so here now my mind's racing because now <laughs> let's say there's somebody riding on the dragon, yeah. commander, commander, so and so. They fly over, you know. They the dragon just you know incinerates everybody. Then they land, and the commander talks to them from on top of the dragon, congratulates them on you know their heroics. Hey, so and so back at the camp you know, needs to talk to you. So see, now I'm combining everything together. What a, it, And that's like, brilliant. that's the thing is like, it gives you the reinforcement idea for the good guys is yeah. such a cool way to introduce I love it. NPC. I love it. Okay. Yeah, it, it's I love fantastic. It. Because when you said reinforcements, I was like, exactly <laughs> yeah. like you said, I'm like, wait a minute. And you were like, hang on, just wait until yeah. I talk about it. And I was like, okay, okay. Yeah. I trust you, man. So <laughs> whatever you're going to say. All right, cool. All right, I love it. Um, let's talk about using the environment in combat because you were talking about yeah. when we talked about this, the situation you're having in your current game. And if I remember correctly, you were saying you're playing a shadow monk, and yeah. and there's yeah. been no place for you to use them. The the second I became a shadow monk, the the we we I feel like we're playing at high noon with zero trees. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> Uh, so one, make sure that that the environment is still you. You don't want to be on a, like a flat prairie land ever. That's really. I mean, I get mm -hmm. there's the moment where that's acceptable, but I I think using environment in combat and obviously I'm I'm a map maker. You can you know I always have some of my maps behind me and stuff like that. Coming up with ways for the map or the environment around you to be usable is going to make combat way more fun. Uh, one of my players, no, excuse me. One of my players in my Pathfinder game, he just got a new spell called like uh, Bone Rattle, mm -hmm. and you grab the skeleton of a creature and basically rattle their bones, and you Ugh. can like move them, and you can't throw them off of a of a cliff. But like to me, that what would be cool? You're up on the side of a cliff. This guy, this magic user, all of a sudden like your body starts to shake as he picks you up and he puts you, and he basically is trying to eat you off the mountain and you basically grab onto it. Cause that, that's basically the way the spell works is you like uh, instead of being completely picked up, you can go prone, but like with the spell, what if you get picked up and put on the very edge and then the next player that goes runs up and uses the shove action to just kick them completely off the cliff. That would be that's awesome. So cool. That is awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. Having, uh, 
you, you're fighting in a cave, right? And there's a you're fighting a giant, and the giant's hunched over a little bit. And instead of swinging his club down at the group, he just smacks the ceiling, and stalactites come falling down. That makes perfect sense. I like it. Having yeah. having stuff in the environment that can play play a part uh, is always really interesting. And uh, oh yeah, like lava having mm-hmm. it where the volcano is wanting to help the fire elemental that is living there mm-hmm. where it's it's basically the lava itself has a, a, a turn in initiative i've done this before give the environment a turn on the uh turn list and like yeah when okay. when when it gets to when it gets to volcano's turn it's good mm-hmm. the volcano's going to do something and you don't know what it's going to do but maybe it's it, it and environment stuff like that you don't always have to make it where it's just an enemy it could just be a random thing that's happening you guys are playing in a volcano it a bubble bursts and anybody within this area gets hit by lava enemy yeah. or ally yeah uh, that makes it, sense it, it randomizes it it keeps players guessing and, and when they don't know what's going to happen it's still interesting one of the ways i've tried to use environment in my games is i will have I'm trying to think of things I've done because I've used Photoshop way back in the day to try to make some maps. And I remember I had, um, this was back in 2017, the players I had at the time, I used Photoshop and made like a path that was going through some woods, but then there were some rocks there and it had, and I used height on them. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. They got attacked by bandits and I had bandits on top of the rocks behind the rocks. I've used trees. I've had people hide behind trees. I've had, rivers I need to cross where, Mm -hmm. you know, there was a log on there or a bridge, but either got washed away or the bad guys broke it. The bad guys are on the other side of the riverbank and they're lobbing projectiles, arrows, or rain spells, you know, Mm -hmm. at them. Um, Something just to be able to, and one of the things about doing that, as you probably well know, is, you know, frontline fighters, you know, and frontline melee combatants usually get a lot of the attention in mm-hmm. combat and so this way it's like this gives a chance for now your spellcasters and your ranged combatants to finally get some of the spotlight because now your yeah. your melee combatants can't get up you know there so that, there's some other things i've done what other ways have you used environment in combat uh you get attacked nearby and the fight leads into a farm field and an enemy just sets the farm field on fire and tries to keep you in it Oh wow, that makes sense. Yep. What What do you do? Like yeah. you can either fight the enemy or try to fight pa- just to get past them. It, it's now not just a combat; it's a I have to get out of this field. Right. So it's stuff like that. Uh, weather. I've had a tornado hit, and the party's basically trying to stay out of the area of the tornado as it's throwing stuff around. Yep. Weather effects. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah, what weather? I I think weather's fantastic. When we played, you had fog and stuff like that. Adding weather mm-hmm. thematically is is super super fun. Yep. But yeah, you you want to get the get the environment involved and don't I've seen DMs do this too where it rains but it's only raining when there's about to be a combat. Yeah. Uh it, if if you're going to have rain in your games and only for combats that you got to make it rain when it's not combat. Too. Right. It's just like in movies. Like every time, yeah. there's, a fun- every time there's a funeral, it's always raining. Yeah. You never yeah. see funerals on days when it's not raining. Because apparently, you know, the weather just waits until there's a funeral. So in D&D, the weather just waits until there's a combat. Yep. <laughs> and then it yeah. starts raining. Yeah, that see, makes I, sense. I think it's really interesting where uh, I've had one where I played with weather a whole lot, right? I was really focusing on weather that campaign. And... So it was the middle of the day and they were near a massive lake, really big lake, like great lake sized lakes. And there was just fog bellowing off of this Mm -hmm. lake. And they're like, that's not normal, right? Something is going on that it's not typically happening. And what it was is there were uh, ice mimps that were living near the, the lake. So the ice mimps were basically so cold that it was causing a heavy fog. Yeah. Uh, and so that sense. that's how they knew that, that you know, the enemies are that way, but it created the environment situation, but they knew something was wrong because of the everyday environment was, it was just so out of place. Yeah. 
No, it makes sense. Um, I like what you were saying about fog because yeah, I remember the live stream that mm -hmm. we did where I was taking you through, and that that was fun because you got to play on your own map. Yeah, but it, <laughs> yeah, it was, was a great fun. it was a graveyard, and yeah, you're right. Fog is great for limiting visibility, but you just have to be fair to the players. I mean, if it's limiting your player the player character's visibility, it needs to limit the bad guy's visibility as well. Yeah, you know. 100%. So so let's let's um, be fair. Um, here. So, I mean, pits is another way that you can use environment where they got to find a way around yeah. something. And a quick side note um, to new DMs. It's not always your job as a DM to figure out a solution to situations. Okay? 100%. That is your player's job to figure out how to get out of the situations. On that, I actually, I found quite a few years ago that if me as the DM, if I came up with a solution to the problem, I was less inclined to listen to the party's ideas for a yep. solution yep. because I had already come up with a solution in my own head. Yep. And because it wasn't my solution, I thought their solution was bad. Yep. Absolutely. So yeah, a lot of times if you're the DM and you stop trying to come up with solutions, a lot of times, uh, and just be open to what the, even if it's crazy, let it have a chance. Maybe, yeah. maybe it starts to fail and tension starts to get ratcheted up quite a bit and they got to re refigure things out. That's interesting. But, you know, be, be open to what they're saying. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's amazing. Your players will surprise you on mm -hmm. how, on how resourceful they can be because pressure and necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. So, yeah. I um, didn't mean to go down that rabbit hole, but just wanted to throw that out there real quick. Okay. I love this next one we wanted to talk about magical items yep and i want to say this first when we get here because you talking about your reinforcement of the unicorn that gave them a unicorn a tear that could heal i'm yeah. going to assume that was a consumable like it was a one time mm -hmm. like yeah. it acted like a potion of healing yeah. yeah and that's one thing that i prefer to do when it comes to magical items and i actually picked this this tip up from watching the dungeon dudes um, video that Monty Martin of the Dungeon Dudes is very fond of giving um, consumables um, um, more than um, permanent than permanent yeah. magic items. Yeah. Um, somebody just said that uh, they're locked on, but they can't hear anything. Um, hmm. Let's say if Cheryl's still there, let's see if she can hear um, real quick. I hate to think that our audio is not coming through. I just turned sound on and I heard both of us. Oh, okay. Okay. No, Cheryl said she could hear us. Yeah. Um, so ask them if okay. they have it muted. That'd be okay. funny. Yeah. Uh, let me ask him real quick. Um, okay. So kind of going into consumables, one of the things that I really like in Pathfinder is I go ahead. For those of you that have been here, I've been diving down the rabbit hole of, uh, a lot more systems uh and in pathfinder they actually have a new consumable called talismans okay you affix them to your armor or your weapon it, you have to do it outside of combat and you can only right. have a couple on your armor you can only have one on your weapon but you can something triggers this like the one of them my player has uh it, it's called like a wolf something and whenever you knock an enemy down you get to add your strength damage to knocking them prone Whoa, 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 whoa! Hang on, hang on a second. So, um, explain. So you have to do it outside of combat. It's a talisman. So you have to fix the talisman. Yeah. Right. So there's a talisman. Right. So, and then what you do? So like th this one in particular, the the character has multiple ways to knock somebody prone, but okay. you can either knock them prone or do damage most of the time, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm following you. So okay. what this talisman does is anytime he, so he has abilities that do damage while he knocks them prone, mm -hmm. but with this talisman, anytime he knocks somebody prone, he can activate the talisman and do his strength modifier as well. When he knocks him prone, the oh, talismans, wow. then they disappear after they're activated. So they're consumables. They're consumables, but okay. they have a wider, uh, it's not a potion, so you're not drinking it. You have, you just have it on your armor or your weapon and they do an mm -hmm. additional effect, but they, tr they typically have like a triggering effect. Like when this happens, you can activate it and then additional things happen. And I think it's a really, really cool way to add consumables 
because it's a lot more controllable type of thing. Wow, I like that. So they can attach it to... Okay, so I'm thinking about implementing this into games. So what does a talisman actually look like? So this one, it, it's called wolf something, and you need to have like the paw of a wolf and then uh, a couple other things. And then okay. this person has magical crafting, so they can craft them. Uh, there's there's all kinds of talismans. There'd be and they the in Pathfinder, it it gives you a description of what each one looks like. Okay. Uh, okay. But yeah, they, they all look really different, and then they they all have different, vastly different hmm. things. I may have to look that up just to, to yeah, uh, implement cool. that. I, that it, is pretty sweet. Consumables are amazing, and kind of for the same reason the dungeon dudes uh, they they dive into it is because it's it's uh, it's just a lot easier to like balance combat around a consumable than it is a really right. powerful magical item. No, absolutely. And I think if I remember correctly, Monty in that video talked about potions, of course, but then he also talked about like elemental gems. Yeah. You know, there I you mean, go. like the fire elemental gem can summon a, well, it summons a fire elemental, you know, yeah. or you have one that can summon water elementals. Now they're, you, they're giving them a, an NPC that's on their side, but yeah. the gem can only be used one time because you have to throw it down and then it shatters. So yeah. what I like about that is that, you know, if you look through the Dungeon Master's Guide or whatever it's called for Pathfinder, and if you look for consumables for them to use, um, that, to your point, makes it so much easier to try to structure and try to prep and try to balance um, encounters. I agree with that. Um, now, go, yeah, ahead. Kind of, go ahead. So going, going into the magical items, we, we had both kind of talked about this a little bit. It was, uh, if the... If the enemy shaman has a wand of magic missiles, the party is not going to find it after he's dead and go, oh my gosh, why did this idiot not use it? Well, because he would be an idiot. The shaman right. would have used it. If you're giving the knoll a plus two longsword, he wasn't using a normal rusted longsword and then he got killed and then they found the... Pl Give the enemies the magical items that you're going to place on them. Right. Yeah. I get so flustered when I'm finding magical items and then the enemy wasn't using them. So I've heard and I've seen some DMs do that to that point. It's like, you know, hey, um, they find a magical item that was that they that the bad guy wasn't using to your point. But I've also heard stories where, you know, like, hey, the goblins, that group of goblins, they obviously had magical bows. You know, like we could tell these bows were magical and then they're dead. Okay, well, we want those bows. Um, yeah, they're not there. What do you mean yeah. they're not there? Don't what do, do you that. mean? <laughs> what do you mean they're not yeah. there? They were using them. Now, here's a question for you. You remember the uh Neverwinter Nights video games that were out during the nineties yeah. and early two thousands. Oh yeah. And they I, had I, a, I, did you have them? Did you play them? Yeah, I, I have them on Steam still. Yeah, so they had an editor with them, where if you knew C++, they had a graphical editor. If you knew C++ a little bit, you could also script some things in there. Yeah. So um, my brother actually had this idea. My oldest brother and I were trying to create uh, a module that we actually ended up never releasing. But um, I had a bad guy in there that I had put this powerful weapon on, and I was like, but I don't want the player to get this. So I want the, but so how do I, and he's like, well, I think it was like a plus four sword or something. I can't remember. And he was like, well, just give them the same sword in the drop, but just make it less powerful. Yeah. So now do yeah. you think it's okay for a DM to do that, to yeah. have, so, okay. Yeah. So you think yeah. that, okay. Because that way your players aren't going to know. Yeah. They're still yeah. going to find now, it. Now I wouldn't say you just got hit with a plus four magic sword and then you yeah don't advertise it yeah say it's a magical weapon and then you know it's right still a magical weapon it's you just, and you know, and make it. sure that if you have paper notes and you go on break they're not coming over and looking at your notes and oh, see that it's supposed to be a plus four and then you give them like a plus one or a plus two yeah so but you know what if that's the case what makes me think about that is then why even make it a more powerful weapon? Why don't you just up their strength score or something? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Just up uh, their I mean, strength score. So I I don't know you when you start doing that you start affecting like if somebody tries to grapple them now they have a higher bonus for that. That's true. Uh, it, it does start to true. it does start to affect a whole bunch of stuff. That is uh, true. 
magical items uh finding it in a treasure pile in the middle of an enemy's like dungeon scenario oh i love that yeah why why is it in the chest like right. they didn't put their magical rings in the treasure they would they would wear them right they would have them on uh yeah don't i that stresses me out unless you can make a plausible case that they just didn't know what it was yeah in that case yeah. you could do it oh oh and i love this one i love video games that do this because this pissed my my brother off so much in one of the never in winter nights games he defeats a dragon goes looks at the dragon horde and then there's like a dragon slayer sword in there yeah. and he's like why would you give me the weapon i could have used to kill the boss yeah. after i kill the boss so I, it, it's interesting because story-wise, it would make sense that somebody else came in with it, died, and it's just in the lair, uh, and the dragon's not going to use it. But it's, you, you know, you could have a really cool story moment where there's the fights breaking out, roll a perception check, all right, you got a 12. You notice a really crazy sword with an uh, orient, you know, ornamental dragon uh, handle and stuff like that uh yeah you grab that and you hit the dragon you know oh but you have to attune to it no because it's story-wise fun you you just attune to it when you picked it up yeah uh, i i also will allow that for magical items let them attune to it really quickly real if 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 it makes the story more mm -hmm. fun do it yeah i mean and that's i really think that's the one of the ways you have less drama at your gaming table is yeah you have to feel out the table and you have to, you know, sense a room, but player fun should always trump the rules. Quick yeah. side note where that comes into play. I have a player in my curse of straw game playing a tabaxi part and he was completely ineffective in combat because he had taken <laughs> situational specific spells. Yeah. Now we all know that the only time you can swap out spells is when you level up. Yep. But I told him, I said, listen, you're frustrated with your player character. I get it. I want you to be happy. I got online with him. We completely swapped out all of his spells. He asked for recommendations. Yeah. I it, The ultimate choice was up to him. Yeah. But I gave him recommendations, and he completely changed his spell build out. And now he is much happier playing his character yeah. than he was before. I've done that before. Let them change mm -hmm. feats. Let, the, you, let them change things. You're in a magical world. It's pretty easy for a DM to come up with uh, you commune with your god and you decided your fighting style is going to be something else. And, you know, like you spend the next couple nights practicing this new fighting style, which you're a martial class anyway. So you you mastered it in a couple days and can now effectively fight like that. Yeah. And as long as it's thematically appropriate and... Yeah you really have a sense that the players really fresh with the characters. Yeah. I'm not yeah. going to let players change just because they want to change. No, it's, it shouldn't be something that you throw around willy nilly, but if it is right. affecting the fun of the player, help them out. Yep. Talk to them, figure it out. Absolutely. One, 100% uh, agree. Uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Ne next, uh, kind of rolling into the next thing. Initiative roll okay. every round or not. Oh, I love how you said rolling into it. That was good. Nice pun. Okay. All right. Let me, let me start this one out because I had a discussion online with some DMs today because somebody brought up their post on Reddit was about re-rolling yeah. initiative. Yeah. And before we got on here, you and I talked about this because I asked you, do you have your players roll initiative every round? You said, no, I have my players roll initiative every round and it's in person and playing online but i'll have yeah. you go first and give your reasons for why you do not have them roll initiative every round okay okay so again i'm very mixed on this because i come from a large background of different styles okay. uh, in fifth edition uh i'm going to have my players roll it typically one time <clears throat> if i have a party of one or two i may roll initiative every single round mm -hmm. the thing about initiative in fifth edition is it's there's not a lot affecting it once you roll it right mm -hmm. in older editions there was a lot that went into initiative sure uh, so it in i played a lot of second edition something that goes into that is whatever action you were taking adjusted your initiative you had to roll every round because a if you were attacking with a long sword the long sword gave you a plus seven initiative so you rolled your your d10 you had a plus seven. 
Yep. If you were casting a magic missile spell, that had a speed initiative of two. So you rolled a 10 plus two. So yep. whatever you told me you were doing, you then you couldn't change what you were doing after initiative. If you said you were casting a fireball mm -hmm. and the warrior runs into melee and starts to fight, you already you already rolled your initiative for the fireball, and this is when the fireball launches. Right. So if somebody else with the sword rolled before you, you are already prepping, casting it as that warrior ran in, and he got faster, and now he's being hit by the fireball. Okay, so let's point this out because we've talked about this, and I've had to explain this to new players. Everybody takes turns in D&D, &D, but technically mm -hmm. everything is happening all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, mechanically, that situation you gave there is mechanically correct. So, in 5th edition, and so th this is the thing, in 5th edition, I may let that play out very, very differently, but mm -hmm. in 2nd edition, because what you were, what whatever you were doing changed your initiative. Mm -hmm. If you used a, a heavy weapon, you were getting a plus 12. Yeah, if weapon speed. To, yeah. yeah, yeah, weapon, weapon speed, speed happened. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it it all mattered so much that in that six second window, it yeah, I it's crazy to see how that that has changed. And, and I don't know, I, I don't know if it's better or worse, but I think it speeds up combat. Okay, it does speed up combat. There are ways that in person you can keep it from slowing down combat. Number one, if I'm playing in person, all the bad guys, if it's the same type of bad guy, like a group yeah. of goblins. They yeah. all have the same initiative count. Yeah. Because if I if I have a group of four or five player characters fighting ten goblins, I'm not rolling initiative for every single one of those. So that one will do differently. What I do in person is I always have a big whiteboard on a stand yeah. or on a wall where everybody can see it. Or if, if you know the times I don't have that, I had a small whiteboard one that I could just hold, and I could easily erase it and write everything back down there. Oh, but yeah. I prefer the, to the have it where boards? everybody could see it. Oh. Yeah. I prefer I remember, to have it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, so I, I remember that. Sorry. The whiteboard just brought it. Okay. I don't play in person very often when I DM from like nine age nine up to like mm -hmm. age 14. And then I finally got my first whiteboard at 14 and it because... was revolutionary. Oh yeah. Having that whiteboard. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Because what I would do is um, in person, if I have a whiteboard with a stand, if it's big enough for all, I have made a chart. And then I had for all the player characters and I had for all the bad guys. And then I would have the, I wouldn't have the bad guys AC down there, but I would have the player characters. I would have their hit points. So I would track it right along with them. Yeah. I would do initiative. I would do effects. Everything was on that whiteboard. Now I don't reorder everybody on that whiteboard. You can't do that. So I would have number. I just, you know, I just have to put the number. So then I'd have to kind of scan it and see yeah. who was next. Now um, I'm sure Foundry works the same as Fantasy Grounds. Fantasy Grounds will reorder everybody for you, which yeah. is nice. Which is one reason oh, yeah. why I, when I'm on playing virtually, I don't mind rolling initiative every round yeah. because it's yeah. reordering. Um, but before I get into my reasons, I want to see if there's any other reasons before why uh, you... So honestly, just kind of going back into the I want combat to be quick. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest drawback I've seen in a lot of D&D games is uh, combat which I don't want it to feel like a video game takes two hours for a simple combat. And right. it's just because it takes a while. People don't know what they're doing. Yep. Uh, and so just adding an additional thing. And, and again, like we talked a little bit last week, how like I let players like pull magical energy out of a, out of a fire nearby mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Like if I can cut 20 seconds from initiative each round, I'm, I'm going to do it. Uh, but again, if there's two players that uh, yeah, let's roll initiative every single round. Okay. So for you, the yeah. main thing is, is that it's just speeding up combat. Yeah. Now, okay. speaking of in, in real life, have you seen the clothespin idea? Yep. I love it. Yep. Yep. Seen that. Go ahead and talk about it, though, for people who may not have seen it. Yeah. Though. So for those of you that don't know what the clothespin, so in your real life games, you can have something that you can clip clothespins on, and you just put your player's names on the clothespin, and you could put enemy. Mm -hmm. If you have a ton of clothespins, I guess you could put whatever it is but whenever you have initiative you put the clothespin in the order and then the next round you would reorder the clothespins yeah yep so that's one way to do it i've seen people put it on just clip it to the top of their dungeon master screen yeah i've seen people you know do that um is that it 
before I go yep. into into mine? That, that's okay. all I got. Yeah, what, what do you got? So here are several reasons why I um, have my players re-roll. The number one reason I have them re-roll initiative every round is because it avoids metagaming. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, because yeah. look at this situation. If you're doing the same initiative order every round, player A, who is a fighter, okay, let's say the previous round, their wizard goes down because the wizard's squishy, okay? Or the cleric goes down, or whoever, whatever, goes down, right? Yeah. Well, let's not say the cleric because the cleric's a healer, he's in this example. The wizard goes down. Next round, the fighter looks at the combat and goes, okay, so it's me, then the cleric, then maybe a couple of enemies and the wizard. Well, yeah. I know the cleric's going to go after me, so I don't have, even though I'm right next to him, yeah. I'm not going to worry about stabilizing him because I know the cleric's behind me and can heal him. Yeah, it, I, I, I get that. I, I definitely see it. It makes mm -hmm. combat more chaotic and it yes. starts to break up that video game monotony of your, your monitoring turn order to know when. Absolutely. To, I, I, I do, I get that and I, I, I can see how that would break up some of that. It does. And the other thing, too, the second reason is, is because it keeps players paying attention. Because if, you know, if you have the same order of initiative and you yeah. know your number with the in, with your allies, with your party and the bad guys, you're number seven. Yeah. You're tempted to do this. Uh, yeah. And get on the phone. Yeah. I hate that so much. I know when right. my players are doing it, too. Right. Uh, now, but, some people, go, ahead. I, go ahead. I was going to say, now, do you coup de gras your players when no. they're down? No. Oh, I do. So it, it, in it, the idea of not knowing who's going to go next, like if you get towards that and you know that me, and I, I don't do it with all monster types. Mm -hmm. I, I think certain monsters will do it and other ones won't. Right. But goblins, goblins a hundred percent will stab you while you're down. So like mm -hmm. in that scenario, if you're the warrior, you don't, and, and you're not for sure when the cleric's going to go, you have to take that opportunity because if the monsters do go first next turn, mm -hmm. they're going to stab him a lot. Yeah. So I spoke too quickly. So I will do whatever is thematically appropriate. I feel like I've said that word a lot tonight. <laughs> thematically appropriate. Yeah. I will do whatever is appropriate for the for the uh, for the uh, for the bad guys. Okay. Yeah. Look at ghouls, for example. Okay. Once they take out a player character, they're going to start dragging that player character away. Once 100%. they go unconscious, they're not going to coup de gras them right there. They're going to start trying to take take off with them. And yeah. so think about that cinematically. In your imagination, you see your buddy go down, and then you've got this undead <laughs> trying to – him. <laughs> or, you know, there's some animals yeah. who might do the same thing too. But I agree with you. A, a goblin, absolutely. They're going to they're gonna take somebody down. They're going to try to coup de gras them. A hobgoblin or an orc, because I think hobgoblins are more akin, uh, more akin to probably taking prisoners. They won't coup de gras them. They're just going to try to knock them all unconscious and then try to take yeah. prisoners because they want, they want slaves. Okay. Um, so, um, it just depends on the situation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's all based off of the monsters and stuff like that. A troll, troll's going to stop and eat you. Yep. Or try to drag you off. Okay. Um, the third reason, oh, go ahead. I what were we going to say? I think, I think a troll would just stop and eat you. They regenerate. I don't know if they care if they get hit or not. Well, that's probably true. That's probably true. So, Third reason why, what were my first two reasons here? Um, I lost my train of thought. So first reason was to avoid metagaming. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, so players pay attention. Third reason is because it keeps your low dex characters, your low dex players from getting depressed because they're like, well, you know what? Everybody's <laughs> taking care of all the bad guys. I'm number seven or eight, you know? So now that they have a chance, maybe they're going to go first. Yeah. You know, it actually helps them to um it, it gives it gives your low decks you know players hey i appreciate that because yeah. every character i've played in the last 10 years has all been low decks right you know what oh quick side note 
Here's one of the fun things about playing a low dex character. It's always so much fun when you're playing a low dex character who does a range attack and they have a minus one ability modifier, yeah. and then you do one point of damage and it becomes zero yeah. <laughs> because you're minus one. My brother was playing in one of my games a couple years ago, and that happened to him all the time. And I was like, well, dude, I said, you're a barbarian. Why the heck are you using ranged weapons? Just stop using ranged yeah. weapons. So... Anyway, but those are my three main reasons for re-rolling initiative um, every yeah. round. And playing on a VTT makes it so much easier. Yeah, and I, I run with a module on Foundry that it's called the Heads Up. Uh, mm -hmm. So whoever's turn is next gets a symbol around them, and there's a yeah. prompt on the window saying, hey, it's your turn next, pay attention. Uh, and that's kind of with the whole phone thing. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because somebody mentioned that on founder today and that was in response to somebody else saying that what matt mercer does on critical Role, which i don't ever watch but i'm going to mm -hmm. start doing this is i read and heard that what he'll do is he'll say hey okay so and so it's your turn what are you going to do so and so you're on deck meaning yeah. that your turn's coming up next so figure out what you want to be doing he does that a lot with a couple people individually because they do. He's got two players that take a really long time. One of his, one of the people on Critical Role, mm -hmm. actually, from just me watching it, and, and great person. I, you know, I'm not saying there's anything bad about it. It, you just have players that do this. It, it, it happens. But mm -hmm. he's, this is him trying to correct and and help out with this. Is this one player will take up almost as much time in one round of combat is almost the rest of the table and he's at a table of seven yeah. uh and i always get frustrated for him and a lot of times it just kills the the momentum of combat when yep. the person is like stumbling on i want to do this oh i can't do that i'll do this oh that's not a good idea i'll do that like don't don't do that don't do that yeah quick quick side note um uh, not that i know a lot about matt mercer but he seems so chill i think oh. it would take a lot to make him mad oh yeah he's a fantastic dm yeah. just watching critical role yeah he's so good have you ever seen him get upset on any of the episodes you've watched yeah i'm just curious okay yeah i'm just curious i i, I think you have to watch him a lot to notice when he is getting upset mm -hmm. he, i mean he doesn't like get visibly mad he's a very mature mm -hmm. uh person and this is like a business for him so he's smart about how if he is going to get upset he's going to be smart about it but yeah you can i've definitely seen where he's gotten frustrated with the players before yeah okay i'm just curious because i don't ever watch critical role so yeah um all right so let's wrap up here we got two topics left here and this is one that you brought up dm's taking forever yeah on their turn for yes. combat don't do that. Don't if you're the DM and you put a spellcaster in the combat and it becomes that spellcaster's turn and you start looking up spells, uh, reading a whole bunch of no, do not do that. That yep. it you are killing the momentum. It, we I just said it. You're killing the momentum of combat. Uh people are gonna start checking out. You yep. you need to honestly uh you have the least amount of time to figure out what you're doing because you have so many more. Absolutely. Uh, the players are controlling one person. Uh, so if they take if they take 30 seconds for their one person, you know, okay, if you're taking 30 seconds per a person that you have, all of a sudden you could be looking at a five minute turn. Like you can't you can't do that. Yep. No, I mean it's not find... fair to your players. No. Uh Damn. so definitely know what know what know your enemy and combat well enough that you can do it quickly. And if you mess up. People mess up in war. Like, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, and, and what I've told my players, too, is if if it's not something we're able to look up the rule for very quickly, okay, we're just going to roll with it. Yep. I'm going to make my decision, and then we'll move forward. There's yep. times that I have misunderstood a bad guy's abilities to, um, I hate to say my detriment, because it's not me against the players, yep. but to their detriment. And yeah. there's times that I've misunderstood an ability of non-player characters, and that has worked against the players. And I've had to go to my players and say, hey, I'm just going to fess up and be honest. Yeah. I, I don't have to tell you guys this, because you don't have to let them know. But yeah. I messed up last session. I had so-and-so do this. This shouldn't have happened. 
And if it's, if the result of that is severe enough, I'll retcon. Yeah. If I make and, a mistake. And, and I think knowing when and to retcon is a very important thing. You shouldn't be retconning all the time, but I mean, right there uh, as a DM stuff, like it, the way you're doing it is ex- the same way I do it. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, if I mess up and it had a really adverse impact on their characters or on the story. Yeah, absolutely. Then I will I, I'll definitely retcon it. I, I'll definitely retcon. I think in the last like two or three years, I've retconned once. Yeah, I can't think of any time I've really, I, I don't think I've done a lot of retconning. Um, I think there's only been once or twice that I've actually done any retconning, thankfully. Yeah, and and so, as you get a lot of experience, it's it's just, it's still going to happen. To, sure. to say it's never going to happen is, is you know, a suicidal statement. Right. Uh, yeah, so I, it's definitely going to happen, and just being aware... It be allowing it to happen when it needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just be honest. I mean, you want your players to be honest with you. Just be honest with mm-hmm. them. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So um, last topic here before we wrap up and <laughs> let your player characters use their builds. Yes. I, I dislike it so much. And as a DM, it is your mm-hmm. job to make, if if a character is building a specific way, you still need to challenge them. I I agree with that, uh, but you have to let them use their build as well. If it's a wizard that is specializing in fire damage, and all of a sudden the campaign takes a left turn and every enemy has fire resistance, yep. you literally change the campaign to screw over one player. Do not do that. Yeah, I mean it goes back to your situation where you're playing a shadow monk, and all of a sudden. Yeah, there's no shadows anymore. There's no shadows it, for you to use. Yeah, it, it feels so penalizing. Uh, it doesn't matter how powerful the build is. You need to allow them to play it and find ways to challenge them anyways. And it's not just by screwing them over, by basically eliminating their entire character. Yeah. Uh, right. I, oh, go go ahead. ahead. No, you go. Uh, you it, weren't done. You know, if, if you have a druid that specializes in, in polymorphing and every enemy has moonbeam that kicks them out of it, having that happen once or twice in a campaign would be interesting. Having three combats in a row do that, I don't want to play a druid anymore. Yeah, it's not cool. That's just not cool. I was going to say I read a, uh, read a story a while back on Reddit, of course, and this player dropped out of a game because a DM who was supposed to be this experienced DM um approve their character no problem and then um oh awesome jared just joined our chat hey. hey what's up jared glad to see you in here bad dm move for sure absolutely yeah. which means that jared's probably done it <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, i'm blow. kidding i'm kidding blow, blow. i haven't i haven't talked to the guy for a while so i had to i had to give him a hard time so <laughs> Don't tell my boss. Okay. All right. Oops. I guess we weren't supposed to say anything. <laughs> but anyway, to finish my story, DM approved the character, and then he started using their abilities in combat. And the DM says, okay, next session. Uh, I think it was like a Gloomstalker Ranger. And they're like, yeah. yeah, you can't use this ability now. And he's like, why not? He did it because it's yeah. OP. It's OP. And then like it went on like two or three sessions where a DM kept telling different player characters. He just kept taking away abilities. Okay, your character yeah. doesn't have this ability. Your character doesn't have this ability. It's too OP. Well, and it's like, Go it, ahead. to me, it's, you know, if I'm playing a barbarian to play as a tank, right? I, I want to be the frontline person. Right. And they, you know, they're taking the bear. They're, they're just taking all of these things that make them really, really tanky. And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, you guys are fighting mind players for the next 15 encounters. Why? They do psychic damage. Right. You can't, you, you literally, you can't do that. You can have a couple encounters that would have creatures that would do that. But if the campaign turns that way, you have an entire character build that you're saying, I understand why you built this. And I did this just because I wanted now, now that is the difference. If session zero, you said, this is an underdark campaign. There's going to be a lot of mind players and a lot of drow. And then the guy's like, I'm going to play a barbarian to be a tank. Probably switch up to something else. About to go there. 
about yeah. to go there because my players, my current players, had ideas for Curse of Strahd until I put together my player's Bible and sent it out to them. And I said, this is what you can expect in this campaign. I love doing player's Bibles because it lessens the the yeah. um, it lessens the length of the session zero that you have to do. Um, but yeah, and Jared, you're exactly, you're about to go exactly where I, you went, where I'm about to go. There's other options at DM to challenge the players. You don't need to be vindictive. Um, yeah. So what I did not like about, I lost my train of thought reading Jared's um, um, chat, but I wanted to jump back to that story I read on Reddit. And one of the bad things about doing that as a DM is that you never grow and develop as a DM. Yeah. You, if, you know what one of my favorite things to do is when the players get like, like if you want to go on Reddit and stuff and find these ridiculous builds, I'm fine with it. I'm honestly, I'm fine with it. I think it's going to be interesting for me as a DM to make combats interesting. But one of my favorite ways to deal with it is, but it, and I've kind of talked to you about this before, especially on the channel, is it's really fun to at some point in time, put whatever they're doing against them right there's a barbarian that's going super tanky you are going to fight a lizard men barbarian who is super tanky yeah like i love that it, oh it's so fun because it and like that's the thing is that combat is going to be frustrating for the players but it's going to be a frustrating in a way that they understand right mm -hmm. i'm not being vindictive it makes sense. The combat's going to go on. It's just letting me show you what I have to deal with. And I have noticed it gives a lot of respect from the players because they're like, I didn't realize how annoying my character really is. You're doing awesome with it. I've had I've had one of my players come to me and say that after I've done that maneuver on them. Yeah, but here's the thing. If I'm playing a barbarian, right, and you put me up against another barbarian, I'm going to say, bring it on. Yeah. Because now yeah. I have a worthy opponent. It, it's absolutely just, yeah it, it doesn't really matter like my shadow monk having my shadow monk jump around the shadows i get how that's really annoying you know what would be really amazing is i jump to a shadow to run away and another shadow monk jumps into that shadow to stab me all of a absolutely. sudden i'm like whoa right like, that'd be really interesting i'm like oh no my my own special ability uh i'm fighting shadow link in the water temple right like yeah. Oh no. Uh so but it obviously if every combat had a shadow monk now yeah. now I'm upset again. So you but it's you got to let them use their builds and it doesn't matter how ridiculous it is. It, it if you know they're doing something that like and this is also important. If they're building a character that really shines in a very specific situation, mm -hmm. give them that situation. At some point in time, yeah. give them that situation. Yeah, absolutely. You want your players to shine. This is why they built their character that way. They yeah. wanted. They wanted. I remember what I was saying earlier. Then I'm gonna. I'm gonna get to a, a question that Jared asked in the chat about yeah. the players' bible I came up with for my Curse of Strahd players. Because once I sent out the players' bible, then they changed their builds because they realized what they were going to be up against. Like, you know, my friend Amy is playing a ranger and she had initially chosen, she was thinking about one subclass. And when I changed it, you know, I mean, didn't change it, but when I told her what the campaign was about, then she goes, okay, I'm going to change to this. And I, I now want my favorite enemy to be an undead. I mean, it makes perfect sense. She's playing a ranger who's going to be fighting undead. It's Curse of Strahd. Yeah. So, I mean, we came up with a narrative reason why her player character hates the undead and that's her favorite enemy and it makes perfect sense so yeah. jared was asking how do you approach a turn in the campaign when the course of the story naturally makes a character redundant so do you, do you have an answer no i want to hear what you have to okay. say first so the the first thing that i'm i'm thinking of is if if the story naturally went that way I should have known about it a little bit beforehand. And there's during session zero, I probably would have talked to them a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be the first step is during the session zero, there should have been a little uh, communication on that situation that you first saw coming up. Uh, if the campaign slowly turns that way, I, if it's a lot of times I feel like really good DMs have a really good communication with their players. 
So if you foresee this coming up, you can you can beforehand start communicating with that player. Hey, this is kind of where the campaign's going. What are you thinking about? You know, we could start working on getting your character in a better situation. Uh, that way, this it does not become unfun for you. Right. If I know an unfun situation is going to be coming up in two months' time, I'm going to start trying to communicate with you. Hey, how can we? What are some magical items that you think would make this workable for you and, and stuff like that? Uh, I think a lot of it's just going to come down to communication, though. Are you saying that in response to his other, his latest comment, this could happen oh, three yeah. years into a campaign, though? So it, I get the feeling that Jared's talking from personal experience because I know he's running a Tomb of Annihilation campaign. So I yeah. wonder if he's talking from experience here. Uh, I mean, for Curse of Annihilation, it's it's such a, a meat grinder type Cur of campaign. Anyways. Curse of Annihilation? Are you combining yeah. oh, Strahd, yeah, yeah, Strahd and Tomb of Annihilation? Bad, <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, yeah, that would be interesting. That gives me ideas. Placing <laughs> Strahd in the jungle now. Curse of Annihilation. <laughs> Vampire in the jungle. There we go. Uh, hey, there you go. I like it. Vampire in the jungle. Uh, that could be workable. I mean, I'm sure. Yeah. Dark, dark <laughs> underbrush. Uh, so if you're three years into a campaign, uh, the the redundancy at the, campaigns change so much once you get above level fifteen. There are a lot of undead yeah. stuff that that yeah. is very very true. Uh, so yeah, I I think once you start getting above level fifteen, a lot of rules for a lot of advice really 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 start to change. Mm -hmm. And that's just because so much starts to go really haywire. And from any time I've done it, and I haven't done it a whole lot, but combats get so incredibly swingy up into those levels. So it, how do you make sure that a character's build is always going to work into the high levels? Uh, it's just going to be a lot of work on the DM and a lot of mm -hmm. open communication because there's you're getting into such an advanced character build mm -hmm. that it it's just going to take a lot of communication. Yeah. I was thinking about that is a lot of open communication. There needs to be some compromise between the DM and the player. My yeah. solution would be, and this would be an absolute last resort. If you cannot come to a workable solution, working with your player to make that character build now viable, maybe it's time to switch to a different character. Yeah, maybe and, that character story is over with. Yeah, I, I I've had very few campaigns make it any. It, the only time I've had a character above fifteen is when we started really really high, uh, going one to twenty. It, the, I mean, the fact Jared that you've done that multiple times is amazing. Uh, not a lot of tables can pull that off. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent, Jared. Yes. Yeah. He yeah. said that you have to build trust. So your players will need to trust that you aren't just screwing them over. It. You have a plan in it all, you know? So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one, a very important thing. And, and Jared, that goes along with the whole premise of this, of this stream, less drama, more fun. You yeah. absolutely have to have trust from your players. They have to trust you in the number one way that you build trust in your players towards you is that you have to be honest with them about when you screw up yeah. and you have to be on their side and show them, you know what it comes down to? My wife and I have talked about this so much and we're like, you would solve a lot of problems in the world if people would just treat each other with respect. Yeah. Stop getting so upset about small things because man, I'll tell you, people get upset about such BS and, and that just is ridiculous. It's and I think this would help everybody out in the D and D world is knowing that the your fun does not trump anybody else's. The okay. game is about fun, but the DM's fun cannot trump the player's fun, and the player's fun cannot trump the DM's fun. And, and one player cannot trump another player's. No, fun. no, and right. and yeah. So I I think uh, as long as we're all being mature and, and the point is to have fun and we're all keeping that in mind, I think you should be able to have a really awesome game. Uh, especially if yeah, communication. Yeah. I absolutely. think that's about all of our topics. It is. Uh, so why don't you tell them what we're talking about next time, Jeremy? 
Yeah. So uh, next time we're we will be on. Let me double check the date. Two weeks oh, from now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this will be on the eleventh uh, Sunday, the eleventh. We're going to be talking about uh, one of my players keeps steamrolling over all of the others. Uh, so that's going to be the topic this week. We just got done with how to make combat not suck without pissing off my uh, without pissing off your players. Uh, we had a lot of really interesting topics. Uh, we kind of surprised each other on uh, more than one point. So that was really, really fun. Yeah. Uh, if you ever want to have a topic that you want us to talk about, feel free. Our socials are down below. Get it to us in some way. We'll put it on the list. We'll probably try to move it up for you. And I was because I my Kickstarter closes in four days. We were kind of talking about that uh, last stream. So that's that's going really well. You got anything before we head out? No, nah, I just wanted to uh, just want to thank Jared and Cheryl and anybody else who's watching. Yeah. Um, and Jared's last comment here: your argument about communication is a really big one. Um, yeah, and I, this is really, really important. And I know we you just did our ending notes, but this is really yeah. important. Um, it, he said he just killed a player last session, but because the players knew that it was a high mortality campaign, there was no bad feelings about it. 100%, and and yeah. that all comes down to setting those expectations at session yeah. zero. And Tomb of Annihilation is an absolute meat grinder. Yeah. So, all right. So want to thank everybody for watching and joining. Um, uh, I am so looking forward, Jeremy, to our next topic, what to do when you have one player steamrolling over the others. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that's it. This was a great conversation. We went for another hour and a half. So I knew this one was going to be a long one. This one was huge. There was so much to unpack with this one. Um, yeah. I think with this one, we, you and I were talking, when we hit the hour mark, I was like, we got to heavily promote this on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Because this one, this one is, there's such great advice, not to, not to pat our, uh, on our, on our shoulders, but you know, there was such really good advice and I learned something from you and I think yeah. you learned something from me in this one. So yeah. that was great. Was fantastic conversation with you tonight. Yeah. I appreciate it, Jeremy. And uh, thanks again, everybody. We will see you next time. Take care. Have a good one. All right. Bye-bye.